Ladies and gents, my name is Brandon Stover. I'm the founder of Plato University. And today we're discussing how you can master any skill with these five science-based techniques. If you'd like to see all five techniques, check the link in the description. In my previous two videos, I went over techniques that were good in the explore stage and then techniques that were good in the engage stage. I'll leave links to those in the description. But today we're gonna cover techniques that are perfect for the execute phase. This is where you're focusing on mastery, taking everything that you've learned in your foundational concepts and in your practice, and now really trying to master those skills, learning all of the steps and being able to apply them, creating something new in the world. So let's get to it and jump into our first active learning technique, which is proceduralization. This is the process of converting declarative knowledge into unconscious procedural knowledge. And this is typically done by taking that declarative knowledge and applying it over and over again until you're doing it in a sequence of steps that you can repeat with practice and start converting that knowledge. If you recall to some of our previous videos, when you're learning, you're creating sets of links that are deposited into the long-term memory. Oftentimes, you're creating these links within your working memory or your short-term memory. So what you're doing most of the time is pretty conscious. You're putting a lot of effort and focus on trying to create those links and put that knowledge into your memory. However, there's a second way that you can store links of knowledge in your memory, and that's through procedural knowledge. The reason that this matters is because when you turn knowledge into easily executable procedures, it allows you to think more quickly, effectively, and effortlessly, freeing up your working memory to focus on higher complex things. Now, your procedural and declarative systems often work in tandem in most kinds of learning, including language, music, math, and everything in between. And there were several decades that researchers thought procedural knowledge only had to do with motor skills, such as learning how to swing a tennis racket. However, research has shown that this procedural system is used in all kinds of learning, going beyond just motor skills and starting to reach into habits or habits of mind, ways of thinking. The relationship between declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge looks something like this. When you're first learning the steps of any type of procedure, you're often creating declarative knowledge. You have to focus intently on that step and start to ingrain it into your brain. But as you begin learning these steps and focusing on them, you start to recognize that the steps follow one another and create a pattern, in which case you only need to remember the first cues in order to launch that entire pattern. This is when the knowledge becomes proceduralized because you only need to focus and remember on that first cue. And then the rest of it becomes unconscious, a procedure that you go through because you've cued that knowledge or that set of links in your memory. This means that you have a trigger up front that cues up the rest of the procedure. Now, creating these procedures allows you to move effortlessly and quickly through your thinking. It allows you to have intuition, or as Daniel Kahneman liked to say, thinking fast, even in stressful situations, allowing you to be more effective when those complex problems arise. So how do you go about proceduralizing knowledge? I started to touch on this between the relationship between declarative and procedural knowledge, but here's the steps. Step one, start learning something with declarative knowledge, focusing intently on the steps and learning each individual step, converting that knowledge from your short-term memory to your long-term memory. Then step two, as you start practicing these steps, recognize the pattern and the link that goes between all the steps. When I do step one, then it cues up step two. And when I do step two, it cues up step three. And then step three in our process that we're talking about now is to engage in deliberative practice until those steps become automatic and a habit for you. So you're gonna focus intently on learning those steps up front. You're gonna notice the pattern of those steps, and then you're gonna deliberately practice that pattern over and over and over again until you can do the entire procedure without thinking about it. Now, as you go through this process, sometimes not every single step is going to be proceduralized, meaning you're not going to have to think about it when that step comes up in which case you may break down a process into sequence of steps. So maybe steps one through five, you're able to proceduralize, but then when you get to step six, you need to have another trigger in order to bring up the rest of the process. However, this creates an interesting mix of knowledge. It means that in the long run, you're less likely to forget things. Here's a few strategies that you can use to go about proceduralizing things. When you're learning an entire skill set, let's say for instance, digital marketing, you can proceduralize certain skills within that skill set before having to learn the skill set as a whole. So you might proceduralize the steps to create a sales funnel while still intently thinking about how to write sales copy. Additionally, you can proceduralize some skills that will act as cues or triggers for other skills. So in our, our example of digital marketing, if you proceduralize creating a sales funnel, 
One of those steps in that process is going to require you to write some sales copy to put into that sales funnel. So when you triggered the steps in order to create a sales funnel, eventually you know you're going to be triggering the steps you need to do in order to create sales copy. If you're studying something like math or science, you can internalize and proceduralize key exemplar problems by working out those problems yourself, listening to intuition, and then checking your process against the example answer. If you're learning a language, you can use things like retrieval practice, spaced repetition, and interleaving in order to make speaking that language second nature. If you're practicing writing or some sort of artistic endeavor, you can use the Benjamin Franklin technique, which requires you to look at other people's style and practice those until it becomes internalized and proceduralized. You can do it like it's your own style. All right, let's move on to technique number two, which is overlearning. Overlearning is the idea of practicing something beyond perfect. See, doing additional practice beyond what is required for you to have an adequate use of that skill can increase the length of time that the memory for those skills are stored. The basic idea is you're practicing a skill or a set of knowledge until you can do it not just adequately, but dang near perfect. As the saying goes, practice makes perfect, but overlearning makes masters. Spending that extra time to learn something beyond proficiency makes performing it second nature to you. Overlearning can be an effective method for short-term returns on your learning. It's particularly effective in the first couple weeks of learning something. However, if you combined overlearning with other skills that we've learned, like spaced repetition, interleaving, and proceduralization, you can use the power of overlearning to increase retention in long-term memory. Let's discuss a few different strategies of overlearning that you can use. The first core practice of overlearning is practicing a skill continuously and refining the core elements, specifically the foundations of a skill that do not change over time. So practicing those foundations over and over and over again. If you've ever met a master in martial arts, they will stress this to you that the foundations are what you need to practice your entire life. This process is best done through immersive experiences and extensive projects where you keep practicing the skill in the place that you want to use it. The second strategy of overlearning is doing advanced practice, going one level above a certain set of skills so that the core parts of the lower skills are overlearned as one applies them. So in our digital marketing example, you may be learning the skills of running Facebook ads, and during that process, you're going to have to keep learning over and over again and practicing the skills of writing copy as you write the different ads for Facebook. So during that process, you're learning some higher level skills, but you're still practicing copywriting the entire time. As I mentioned before, when you're applying overlearning, use things like spaced repetition and interleaving that repetition in different contexts. This is going to help out with FAR transfer. When information is learned in one context and is retrieved and applied in a different context, as you're learning the key principles of different examples that you're working on when studying foundational concepts, you begin to see the underlying thread and how they can be applied to different contexts. Another strategy you can use is using different material to help you practice the same concepts. This allows you to learn that concept from different perspectives in order to gain a greater understanding. And with repeated and increasingly detailed exposure, your brain is able to figure out where the details fit into the larger picture. And this practice also demonstrates that it's okay if we don't understand something the very first time it's presented to us. All right, let's talk about the third active learning technique in mastering anything, and that's doing experiments. When you're doing an experiment, you're applying skills outside of the way that you originally learned them. And we're specifically going to discuss three different types of experiments. One is experimenting with learning resources, discovering the right guides and resources that are going to work best for you for learning. The second thing is we're going to experiment with technique learning all the subtopics or subskills of a specific skill set in order to become a master of the entire skill set. And third, we're going to experiment with style, where we study another master style, taking the foundational ways of performing that skill and adding our own unique twist on it to create our own style. See, as you become a master of any skill, it becomes harder and harder to progress with your learning. Running experiments allows you to practice that skill in new and novel ways. As your skills develop, it's simply not enough to keep following the examples of others. Eventually, you're going to have to go out on your own. And as you do that, you'll find that there are dozens and dozens of resources for beginners, but almost zero for people that are on a mastery level. And you'll find that your abilities often stagnate after you've mastered the foundations. So as you continue in your learning, not only are you having to learn how to solve problems you've never encountered before, 
but you must also unlearn stale and ineffective approaches for solving these problems. Because a master knows not only how to solve a problem, but the best way to go about solving that problem. And any of the people that are at the top level of their skills are rewarded not just for applying that skill, but doing it with originality. So by creating your own experiences, you're leading yourself down a path of mastery that's going to set you apart from everyone else. This will make you unique and more valuable. So I'm going to go over five tactics that you can use to start running experiments. First, you can use the copy then create method, where you're copying the work of one master and then using that to create your own work or your own application of that. Copying simplifies the process of experimenting a bit because it's giving you a beginning point for making your decisions. Additionally, when you're attempting to emulate someone else's work, you have to break down why they did the work that way, helping you understand the underlying principles better. The second tactic you can use for experimenting is comparing methods side by side, trying two different approaches to solving a problem and varying only a single condition between those two. With this tactic, you gain a greater understanding of which methods work and which ones fit more personally with your style. And you'll get much better information about this comparison if you only vary one detail between the two methods. Additionally, as you solve problems with multiple different methods, you're going to increase your breadth of experience, knowing which methods work best and when to use certain ones. The third tactic for running an experiment is introducing new constraints. So you're going to introduce and set a new constraint for yourself that make using the old methods that you've used before impossible to use this time. This tactic is going to shake up the way that you do things so that you don't become dogmatic and only solve problems in one way over and over. The fourth tactic that we're going to use for experimenting is creating a hybrid of unrelated skills, where you're combining two unrelated skills to create a unique skill set. For many areas in life, combining two skills that don't really relate to one another can bring a distinctive advantage to you over the people that only specialize in one skill. You're able to create broader connections between concepts because you've varied your skill set. And the fifth and final tactic that we're going to use in experimenting is exploring the extremes, pushing the boundaries beyond what other people have done with this skill. By pushing things to the extreme, you're able to search the space of possibilities and giving yourself a broader range of experience with this skill. All right, on the technique number four, which is the generation effect. The generation effect is when you go through the process of creating something new, and during that process, you had to recall information, actively engage with it, in order to create that new something. In the research literature, the generation effect shows that information is better remembered when it's actively recalled and used, rather than simply rereading it somewhere or looking over your notes. And speaking of mastery, the master not only understands the skill, not only is able to apply the skill, but the master is able to use that skill to create something new. To this day, researchers are still not quite sure how the generation effect works. In one camp, they see that generation effect may activate the semantic memory, which is the general world knowledge of facts, ideas, and concepts. In another camp, the process of generating knowledge may initiate some particular encoding process that wasn't activated when you were first reading or learning the material. Another theory believes that when you're actively manipulating knowledge, you're beginning to understand the relationships between different concepts, facilitating the retrieval of that information when it's needed later. Whatever the origin of the generation effect, it's been shown multiple times that it helps out a lot when it comes to learning and remembering information. Beyond that, though, you're going to build the muscle of actually applying skills, recalling it from your mind, and creating something new in the world. Every great inventor, thinker, or entrepreneur has the ability to create new things from the material that they know. So let's discuss how you can use the generation effect. When you're given a problem, whether a simple math problem or a problem you approach in your life, try solving that problem using the knowledge that's in your mind before looking over any material in order to solve that problem. To take this a step further, try approaching problems that you've never been faced with before and solve that problem using only the information in your memory. The act of engaging in the problem-solving process hugely enhances the understanding that we gain from active recall. It's even true if we don't get the right answer. Just going through that process is going to help us understand that information more. As you're learning, some other ways that you can engage in the generation effect is by reading half a chapter and start asking yourself questions about what you just read to try and generate a concept of what you think the rest of the chapter is going to be about. You can also do this with videos, watching a video a quarter or halfway through and trying to predict and generate what you think the rest of the video is going to show or be about. If you're doing something like learning how to code, 
You could follow a few examples, learning that code well, and then going over and trying to code something yourself without looking over the material. And finally, one of the best ways to generate material and create new understanding and new concepts of something is to actually teach it to another person, which is going to lead us into our fifth and final act of learning technique, which is teaching others. Teaching requires us to imagine new and alternative ways to understand a subject, and then take those understandings and create simpler, more creative ways to transmit that understanding to other people. And this is the ultimate test of a master, if they're able to take the knowledge that they know in their head and transmit it to another person. Because it feels impossible to try and teach somebody if you don't fully understand a topic. And teaching someone else is an incredible motivator for learning. Because when we've committed to teaching something to somebody else, we're compelled to improve our own understanding of it. Additionally, when you're teaching someone else and they don't understand a topic as much as you do, it presents unique challenges because other people learn in different ways. And so you have to take that knowledge and spin it so that they also understand it. And during this process, you're going to have to dissect that subject down into its foundational concepts, which is only going to give you a greater understanding of it. Additionally, those learners are going to ask you questions about what you're teaching. And sometimes this is outside the scope of your knowledge, forcing you to figure out what the answers are to that and filling your own knowledge gaps. And this helps you avoid something known as the Dunning-Kruger effect, where you believe that you know everything there is to know about a subject. But in fact, you have quite a few knowledge gaps. So in the process of a teaching, you're forced to actually prove that you know something, going through the process yourself, not just taking what you think you know at face value. So let's talk about a few different strategies that you can use to maximize the potential of teaching others for your own learning. A fantastic technique that you can use is the Feynman technique. First, choose a topic that you wish to learn about. Second, pretend that you're teaching that topic to a child, specifically a sixth grader. Write down an explanation to that topic and say it out loud. And then third, identify any gaps in your understanding that may show up when you try and simplify this concept. Go back to the source material that you learned from and try and fill in those information gaps. Step four, review and simplify your explanation again. And then step five, test out that explanation by actually teaching it to somebody else. So real quickly, you choose a topic, you write an explanation for it, something that you could explain to a sixth grader, you look for any gaps that you have in your knowledge and try and fill those. You review and simplify that explanation one more time, and then you go tell it to somebody else. If you're teaching somebody a concept, ask yourself, how could you convey this concept to somebody that's never heard of it before? If you're teaching a problem, explain how to solve it and crucially, why you made the decisions you did in the process to solve that problem. Other strategies that you can use when you don't understand something at all, try and go back and forth between your explanation that you've made and the one that's in your book or whatever learning resource that you're using. Understand what the discrepancy between those two are. When you're solving a difficult problem, solve the problem step by step, writing down why you took each step that you did in the process of solving that problem. And when you're wanting a full comprehensive understanding of a topic, create new examples, illustrations, or visualizations of the topic so that the idea is comprehensible to even the complete novice that's never seen it before. Now, these active learning techniques will supercharge your ability and your students' ability to become smarter, remember more, and master any skills. But where do you use them? How do you integrate them into your courses? Use the link below and let's schedule a free call together. I'll help you work through your ideas and develop a strategy so you can use these techniques inside your course. When you get on the call, there's no hard sells, because if you'd like my help implementing the strategy, then I'd be happy to do so. Otherwise, you can take the strategy and run and implement it yourself. So use the link below. And let me help you turn your wisdom into actionable education. Let's build something great together. That's it. That's a wrap, folks.